Um, welcome to the first ever OCB webinar event. Um, we're really pleased with a very large turnout. We had 160 registrants. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Heather Benway. I'm the executive officer of the OCB program and project office, which is based here in Woods Hole at the Woods Hole Oceanographic. To learn more about our program, you can just visit the links that are on this slide. Um, our Twitter handle is there as well. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-hosts, May Mahegan, um, who is the OCB communications officer managing the slide work to help put this webinar together. And Matthew, who is the guru in HUI information services, and any of you who have attended the OCB summer workshop know Matt well. He pretty much makes all of the, um, makes everything go as far as the audio visual. Uh, this, webinar, th this webinar is part of our first virtual meeting of a newly funded OCB working group on filling the gaps in observation-based estimates of air-sea carbon fluxes. Uh, since the first day of talks are going to focus on providing an overview of the current state of knowledge on the global ocean carbon sink, including the status of international synthesis and observational activities and programs, the working group members really wanted to open this up to the broader ocean carbon community, uh, most of whom have actually contributed to a lot of these activities. Um, so we wanted to provide these opportunities for feedback and discussion to guide future working group activities. They'll be having a smaller just working group members meeting tomorrow to follow up on, on some of the discussions and outcomes from today. Um, there's a link to the working group webpage on this slide, uh, which includes the meeting agenda. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide provides a few of the ground rules. Um, best practices um, for a run. Very important stuff here. The speakers are going to stay on time. Um, and Galen is going to wield the gong. So if anybody goes over their eight minute allotment, we'll, she'll be talking to you. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the OCB YouTube channel. So anybody who can't make it can come back and see it later. We'll include a link to the video on the working group website. Um, as attendees, you've all come in muted just to reduce background noise. We've included a brief 15 to 20 minute discussion period at the end of each block of talks. So please hold your questions until this discussion block and use the Q&A function to enter your questions. There are instructions on how to access that right here. There's a little dot, dot, dot at the screen. If you click on that, it'll pull up a little menu, a sub menu, and you can select the Q&A function. Um, we will be moderating and reading and addressing the questions as they come in during that discussion time. Um, if you join the webinar and find that your internet is too unstable, we've included the phone audio dial information here, and you can also access that from, um, from your WebEx screen. If you go to the next slide, summary of all of the WebEx functions. Um, if any of you have technical issues or questions, please send a chat message to the hosts. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Galen McKinley and Peter Landschutzer, who are the working group co-chairs, to kick off this brief working group member and guest panelist introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today, everyone in the working group, invited guests, and the attendees. Uh, I hope that everyone's well and uh, staying positive in these challenges, challenging times. You know, we'd hope that this working group could meet in person, but I do see it as a silver lining that our being virtual allows us to share these discussions with um, so many of our colleagues across the world who are interested in ocean, coastal, and carbon cycle science. So really thank you to everyone for being here. I also wanted to note that uh, many of you are aware that we had intended to hold this meeting in conjunction with the Takahashi Symposium at Lamont which would have honored the life and pioneering work of Taro Takahashi, who passed away on December 3rd of last year. The symposium has been postponed due to COVID, and uh, I hope you will consider attending when we're able to hold this event. Um, this working group, as Heather mentioned, is entitled Filling the Gaps in Observation-Based Estimates of Air-Sea CO2 Fluxes. We proposed it last year, and we're funded for three years. And our goal is to really identify some key gaps in observation-based estimates of air-sea fluxes and, and those that are really relevant to the large regional to global scales. 
And uh, one of the several key challenge areas we want to really talk about here is the quantification of fluxes in the coastal zone where the land and ocean carbon uh, budgets really directly meet. And we don't have great connections in our global budgets at present. So we really want to work on that. I want to thank the OCB office uh, and, uh, and Matt Barton and the other folks at HUI who are making this event possible. Thank you very much. Um, and as you can see at the agenda, before I get started, I just want to remind everyone that the goal of this meeting is really to focus on three questions. How well do we know air sea CO2 fluxes uh, and their variability in space and time? What are the most important uncertainties? And those would be the uncertainties most important to global regional budgets. And what can this working group do uh, to bridge from direct observations to global and regional synthesis uh, in, a, in a relatively short time frame? Um, so we're going to begin now with some uh, introductions by each working group member and then move into some open sessions on the open and coastal ocean. We're going to hear about some observational and synthesis programs, and then we'll have discussion at, at, uh, at the end of the day, setting up for uh, tomorrow's working group discussion. Perhaps I've introduced myself before speaking, but I'm Galen McKinley. I'm a professor here at Columbia uh, and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in New York. I study the global ocean carbon sink and its variability in space and time, interested in physical and biogeochemical mechanisms uh, at the global scale. And then North Atlantic is a region of particular interest where I've worked for a long time. My group, we both look at PCO2 data directly and do analysis of that. And we also use ocean and climate models to try to understand the sink. Uh, two points of work uh, that I'm very excited about right now uh, that are in press or in review. The first is we're trying to explain what drove the decadal variability in the global ocean sink in uh, recent decades. And we show that uh, external forcing is likely has a really important role to play in the variability of the sink. We show with a relatively simple box model that external forcing from the growth rate of atmospheric PCO2 and the eruptions of large volcanoes, particularly El Chichon and Pinatubo, really are able to explain most of the coherent variability in the sink uh, since the 1980s. That paper is in press with AGU advances and should come out in the next couple of weeks. The other work we've been doing on with, uh, in, in conjunction with many of you here on the working group and in the audience uh, is a large ensemble test bed that we're using to statistically assess the ability of uh, the SOM FFN neural network reconstruction uh, to, um, to be able to reconstruct PCO2 at the global scale. So the idea here is we don't know what truth is for the real pattern of PCO2 in the global scale, but if we sample a, a model as the observations and then redo this reconstruction, we have within this model world an ability to assess the test bed's um, ability to extrapolate uh, and look at um, bias and seasonality and the quality of the reconstruction. And in this case, we're doing this with 100 different members of uh, from four different large ensemble models so that we can really statistically assess the ability of these uh, the reconstruction. We show that the approach works really very well, a low bias and has very good uh, reconstruction of the seasonality. And we can quantify the degree to which that works at every point on the globe. Um, but we do find that in the uh, very sparse example of Southern Ocean, um, there it's more challenged to represent uh, decadal variability uh, and that um, adding sampling in the Southern Ocean would really help resolve those issues. So that's the work we've been working on that papers in review and I'll pass it on to the next person. Good morning, everybody. I am Cross. I'm a researcher at NOAA PMEL, and for the most part, my job is coastal oceanography. I spend a lot of time thinking about ocean acidification in and around Alaska. Uh, but I do do a little bit of uh, work with PCO2 flux and CO2 transport, uh, in, especially regarding Arctic issues and coastal issues in the Western Arctic. Uh, one of the bodies of work that is coming out right now, um, especially given all of the recent observations that we've been able to make of the surface ocean in the Western Arctic uh, from new platforms uh, such as uh, gliders and drones. I'm showing here in the upper right hand corner uh, an output of last year's sail drone missions. Um, what this is showing is that ice melt is a very efficient, uh, but ultimately a small sink of atmospheric CO2. As sea ice melts in the Arctic Ocean, uh, it shallows the surface layer, ultimately lowering the potential volume of atmospheric CO2 that can be absorbed. Uh, 
that being said, um, a very highly productive and efficient biological pump that um, uh, is mostly confined to the continental shelves can really draw in a lot of carbon uh, and facilitate storage in subsurface Arctic waters. So even though what we traditionally think of as the surface ocean CO2 sink um, might be small, might be shrinking, um, due to uh, climate change and sea ice area losses, um, there's still a potential to store a lot of carbon in the subsurface in the Arctic Ocean. Um, that being said, those subsurface reservoirs are not perfect. I'm showing here along the bottom and evidence of an upwelling event that occurred in the Beaufort Sea. Um, as sea ice area uh, continues to decline, um, there's an opportunity for wind to exert more pressure on the surface ocean and generate more of these kinds of upwelling events. On top of that, freshening and changes in circulation patterns that occur over the continental shelves are likely going to change the ventilation um, of the Pacific halocline and some of these other subsurface water masses and understanding what that means for the Arctic Ocean carbon sink and how we can uh, expect to to or how we can predict what that storage is going to be more efficient less efficient in the future is something that i'm really interested in and i'll pass it off to the next person yeah hi everyone uh, my name is tim devries i'm at uh, uc santa barbara um, so i'm a, a modeler i'm interested in uh, just broadly the global ocean carbon cycle um, anthropogenic CO2 in the ocean, um, the biological pump, uh, and mainly I'm working with uh, ocean inverse models uh, and models of, uh, of carbon cycle and carbon biogeochemistry. Um, so the figure I have here is, is from a, a paper uh, from last year in PNAS where we looked at um, a comparison of, of different uh, methods of estimating ocean carbon uptake. Um, so we looked at uh, PCO2-based reconstructions um, from the SOCOM project, um, ocean biogeochemical models from the uh, Global Carbon Project, uh, and then this uh, ocean, ocean uh, circulation inverse model for OSIM um, that I use in my research, uh, and compared the uh, kind of uh, trends, uh, decadal trends in the uh, ocean carbon uptake in each of those models, um, and noticed that uh, the ocean carbon uptake uh, sorry, the decadal trends in um, uh, the natural carbon sinks were um, driven uh, maybe about uh, five to forty percent were due to the to the ocean carbon sink. Um, and the methods more or less agreed in their uh, sign and magnitude of the variability. Uh, and uh, at least in the um, ocean biogeochemical models, we saw that that variability was due to um, climate variability which caused changes in uh, either the solubility, um, circulation, or the biology of the ocean. Um, so I'll pass it off to the next person. My name is Judith Haug. I work at the Wigner Institute in Bremerhaven, Germany. I'm a marine carbon cycle modeler working on interpretation of the model results, but also model development, working on um, the unstructured mesh model FISOM together with our biogeochemistry model RECOM. I am also responsible for the ocean carbon sink estimate in the global carbon budget, and, and I'm heavily involved in the uh, RECAP 2 ocean component, the regional carbon cycle assessment and processes on the side of the model pro modeling protocol, for example. Um, my main interest is in the polar regions, and that's also illustrated in the figure on the right, um, showing the ocean carbon sink estimate in the global carbon budget, and that really the, the discrepancy in the global carbon sink estimate between the model mean and the data products can really, to a large extent, be explained by the discrepancies in the Southern Ocean, and that's with regard to the mean, the trend, and the multi-year variability. And I'll talk later more about the global carbon budget estimate. Thanks. Hello and good afternoon. Um, so my name is Peter Landschitzer, and I'm group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Metrology in uh, Hamburg in Germany. Um, so broadly, my interest is in the observation-based estimates of the global ocean carbon sink and particularly its variability in time and space. 
I'm very interested in the observations itself, but also in the method side of things. So I'm, I'm very interested in um, analysis and um, extrapolation techniques uh, based on artificial neural networks. Um, in general, I've got an interest that uh, the, in general, the ocean carbon cycles are not only surface process in their sea exchange. And uh, data analysis and synthesis is something that I'm focused on past years. So um, I've put up two um, key results that I uh, would like to sort of present here a bit. And the first one is actually something that my colleagues have uh, named before, and that is sort of this decadal variations that we find in this um, observation-based observation reconstruction of the ocean carbon sink. So I also want to understand where this, this decadal variability comes from, um, how, it, how does it compare with other methods, and uh, what's the uncertainty in it, in these uh, reconstructions, and how would new and alternative um, uh, measurements uh, contribute to the, to the evolution of these uh, estimates. And secondly, uh, I want to understand the, the entire uh, ocean carbon sink. So I don't want to um, sort of focus so far on the open ocean, but I would like to sort of see open ocean and coastal ocean come together and really provide a complete um, marine carbon sink estimate that really includes open ocean, coastal ocean, and uh, also uh, Arctic Ocean marginal seas, which have in the past been, uh, well, wouldn't say ignored, but uh, wasn't, wasn't included. Uh, and that's why I'm also, um, it's what I would like to see here in this, uh, this uh, group happening, but I will talk a bit more about that also later. Thank you. Hello, so this is uh, Gould van la Ruel. Uh, I'm um, from Brussels, the Université Libre de Bruxelles. And so uh, I'm um, also working on uh, uh, the coastal ocean and actually with Peter, uh, trying to uh, produce some data-driven uh, PCO2 maps for the coastal ocean uh, using the same artificial neural network that he has been applying for the open ocean. So that's one of the uh, main things I've been uh, working on and that I will talk about uh, today. And uh, I'm uh, also interested in the dynamics of uh, carbon in estuaries. And so I've been also working on uh, um, a generic uh, estuary model that has been uh, applied to a number of systems to also uh, look at uh, what happens to um, carbon and nutrients through the uh, estuary filter. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically me. And uh, yeah, I have a very low internet connection, so you will have to uh, do just with my picture. So I'm leaving it to the next speaker. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. My name is Nikki Lewandowski, and I am an associate professor at the University of Colorado here in Boulder when I'm not trapped in my house. Um, I am very interested generally in the role of the ocean in the global carbon cycle. I particularly enjoy interpreting output from models in the context of the observational record. And the Southern Ocean has a warm and special place in my heart. I really like thinking about the Southern Ocean. Um, I couldn't come up with the best figure to show you or the best paper to highlight right now. So I just put a cartoon that appears on my research group webpage because I like how these clouds look so cute. Um, this is trying to emphasize that atmospheric variability can have an influence on the ocean carbon cycle. And this is something that I'll be talking about in um, a couple of minutes here this morning. Pedro, you're up. Maybe you're muted. Pedro, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we go on. And while Pedro works on his connection, I think we're having a, uh, maybe you need to call in or something. Yeah. Lore. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Hello? Yep, now we can hear you. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, so I'm Laura Splendy. I'm at, I'm at Princeton University. Um, I work on biophysical coupling at the global from global scale to sub mesoscale and have a special interest in ocean carbon and oxygen cycles and understanding their variability, their trends, and the mechanisms that control them. I have also um, an interest in understanding the land ocean continuum and, and the river uh, lateral fluxes of carbon. And I work at the global scale, but I also have a special interest in the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and here I, I just illustrate with two um, um, studies. One is uh, a work by my postdoc, Enhui Liao, which is submitted, and it's um, He's been looking at how El Nino and uh, La Nina and, and, and so in general um, modulate the CO2 drawdown uh, of the ocean. It creates an anomalous CO2 drawdown. And uh, if I'm um, that nice amplification by forward Ekman transport of the, the anomaly and how the different events, linking the different events, different ENSO events to uh, the strength and the pattern, the distribution of to uh, draw down by the ocean in the Pacific Ocean. And the second thing that I'm showing here, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is about how to constrain, how to find uh, constraints on the um, natural cycle, the natural ocean outgassing, and the natural uh, carbon transport in the ocean, and how that can provide insights on the river uh, carbon transport. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, everybody. I'm Christian Rodenbeck. I'm working at the uh, MPI for Nuclear Chemistry, Vienna. And the uh, kind of big headline on my work is interpretation um, of the carbon cycle, so meaning the fluxes and the processes which uh, determine the fluxes and their variability. And of course, one of this is then um, quantifying ocean CO2 fluxes. Um, Mainly from PCO2. Uh, on, um, on this quantification from my side is uh, actually the interannual variability and understanding the, the drivers of um, interannual uh, variability. Um, we also looked at um, another tracer, tracer atmospheric potential oxygen, uh, measurements of oxygen in the, in the atmosphere, which also um, give constraints on the Ocean flux, All, although it's um, yeah, a bit more involved to get the information uh, from these uh, tracers um, about the fluxes. And maybe for, um, for completeness, I also mentioned the atmospheric CO2 inversion, so using um, atmospheric CO2 data uh, to infer fluxes um, at the surface. Uh, less interesting for the ocean because it's, uh, the ocean is not so well seen, but it's uh, um, the, let's say the, the best constraint we have for the for the land fluxes in terms of the of the observation, and all these products uh, kind of are uh, summarized um, uh, under the, the Vienna Carbon Scope uh, yeah, headline or um, in our available um, collaborative projects um, if anyone is interested. That slide I uh, picked um, from recent. Or recent and even um, unfinished results. Um, so the headline of the uh, OCP working is uh, filling gaps. And so I decided to uh, talk here about the filling of the gaps in the early decades. Um, so these are two data in, in, um, in a large, uh, in a sufficiently large number are only available in the uh, yeah, 1990s uh, onwards and maybe a bit in the 1980s. But before that, uh, we have hardly any um, PCO2 uh, data. But on the other hand, of course, it's also interesting what the ocean is, uh, is doing there. And also in particular, um, in conjunction uh, with the atmospheric version, where you need the ocean constrained as an, as an input. So we decided to uh, use um, uh, a regression-based method to extrapolate uh, back to the, to the early decades. Uh, uh, the different PCO2 based um, ocean products, um, which are uh, available uh, by different groups, are mostly either regression based or they are a kind of, kind of auto regressive um, methods which just use the data and interpolate them. And 
So we decided to combine these two kind of uh, because um, a regression based method is able to interpolate or, or to extrapolate, whereas um, an autoregressive method is uh, able to follow all the signals in the, in the data. And so what we try here and the, what we call the hybrid ocean scheme in blue uh, is to combine these two um, and to get kind of the largest bit of information uh, out of the, of the data. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rem HR. I'm a professor of oceanography at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, I, I work on the carbon cycle like everyone else. Uh, my focus in the past uh, decade or so has been in the coastal zone, and I'm particularly interested in carbon and, and oxygen cycling, using oxygen as a uh, tracer for metabolism of estuaries. I'm also interested in how climate change uh, affects coastal waters, uh, particularly sea level rise affecting salinity and uh, and hypoxia. I'll be showing um, in my in my presentation some of the carbon budget work we've been doing. We put together one of the few regional carbon budgets, detailed regional carbon budgets for tidal wetlands, estuaries, and uh, shelf waters for for eastern North America. That's been part of a NASA funded synthesis project. I'll show that figure in my, um, in my presentation. I mean, the upshot of that is that when you're looking at coastal zone carbon budgets, all three of those systems, tidal wetlands, estuaries, and shelf waters have, have important uh, and, and large fluxes, even tidal wetlands, which, which uh, occupy a very small area of the coastal zone. Here I'm showing some more focused work in uh, Chesapeake Bay. This is a recent paper we published in, in JGR Oceans looking at alkalinity in the tidal tributaries of Chesapeake Bay. It's kind of a dendritic system with lots of different tributaries. And uh, the point of this figure, um, this is showing the alkalinity in, in the tributaries as a function of salinity. and um, you can see the zero salinity end member uh, really varies quite a bit, like almost an order of magnitude within a single sort of large estuarine system. That's one point. The other is is that uh, behavior you you, you see di uh, departures from linearity, um, both above and below um, below the uh, below the uh, mixing line, uh, showing not conservative behavior. That is both production and consumption. Of, uh, of alkalinity. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Sabine. I'm a professor of oceanography at the University of Hawaii. I'm also the uh, associate dean for research here. And being in Hawaii, it's 5.30 in the morning. So good morning, everyone. Um, I work on the global carbon cycle, as means everyone here is, uh, in particular interpreting uh, inorganic carbon in the ocean and um, understanding ocean acidification. On the right, I show a couple of things that I've been working on here in Hawaii. On the top is the 30-year uh, ocean time series from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series site where uh, I'm starting to develop a carbon budget looking at the natural and anthropogenic cycling of carbon on this 30-year time series to try and understand how uh, it varies with time over different time scales. And then on the bottom uh, is a figure showing a uh, number of CO2 moorings that we've got around Oahu we've got four CO2 moorings that are uh, within about 20 kilometers of each other. Um, and you see that they've got quite different uh, patterns of variability, indicating that um, there's a large spatial heterogeneity in the 
CO2 fluxes in coastal waters, uh, even even around Hawaii. Um, the green figure there is a actually a fig is a uh, mooring that we've got on a coral reef, which shows by far the largest variability. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the IOC Integrated Ocean Carbon Research Working Group, the IOCR, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later today. Happy to be here. Looking forward to the meeting. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adrienne Sutton. I'm an oceanographer at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle. And a lot of my time is focused on running a long-term um, observing network of autonomous measurements on buoys started by Chris Devine about 15 years ago. And if you're using SOCAT data, you're using these time series data um, they, on these buoys, we measure air and seawater PCO2 directly, as well as some of the buoys also have wind speed and uh, seawater pH measurements as well. And uh, last year, the figure on the top right is a um, uh, figure that was in a uh, paper that we published that was a data product of the time series that, uh, that gives easy access to all of these buoy time series. And associated with that paper, we looked at trend detection times for uh, surface seawater PCO2. So that's what that figure is showing. We have a lot of buoys that are in the coastal um, and coral areas around the US. So at those sites, you see a longer trend detection time. Um, a lot of my work is focused on looking at um, uh, teasing apart what is natural variability and what is long term change. And so this is this, this was some work that was addressing that. I also work on carbon sensor development and most recently we've deployed um, the similar air seawater CO2 system that we deploy on buoys. We've deployed on wave gliders and sail drones. Um, the figure at the bottom right shows uh, CO2 flux measurements from the sail drone that circumnavigated Antarctica last year. And what we're really focused in that work, um, because we can measure wind speed, air, and seawater PCO2 directly, we're really focused on constraining uncertainty and CO2 flux based on different methodologies. So Nancy Williams and I are working on, on that right now. Um, and I'm also involved in a lot of uh, ocean observing system planning, um, as well as uh, best practices for measurements and analyses. So thanks, happy to be here. Rick, are you there? Hello, can you, can you hear me now? There's a lot of feedback. Yes, ma'am. Can you try again, Rick? Sounds like Rick may have uh, a phone connected and his computer connected. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, while he works on that, is, pa is Pedro connected? Can he give his intro or? Um, he needs to check his microphone. We can uh, unmute him and see how it goes. All right, let's try that. So May, you will need to unmute Pedro.
think uh, we've lost Pedro off the audio at the minute. We could go to Nancy and then back to Rick. Oh yeah, great. I'm sorry. I, I, let's do that. Yep. Okay, you're up, Nancy. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. All right. Uh, so I'm Nancy Williams. I am a new faculty member at University of South Florida College of Marine Science. And uh, I am focused mostly on the Southern Ocean's role in the global carbon cycle. And much of my work uh, to date has been through the SOCOM project, which I'll talk about uh, later in the observing system um, talks in the afternoon. And uh, so specifically, I've been focused a lot on how well can we measure uh, the carbonate system from autonomous platforms that are equipped with just a pH sensor. And um, the figure on the right is showing kind of a, a summary figure from my 2017 paper uh, where we did a really careful uncertainty analysis of all the ways that we're introducing uncertainty into a PCO2 calculated from a float-based pH sensor. And um, so I've been, interested really in kind of how well we can do that and then how can we integrate these data into um, our other data products, recognizing that they have increased uncertainty relative to a direct measurement of PCO2, but that uh, they still have value, especially in parts of the ocean where we really don't have a lot of measurements. Um, and the Southern Ocean is, obviously one of those places, uh, especially in winter time. And um, so mostly that's been with uh, Argo floats, but I'm hoping to kind of move into using gliders. And then also, as Adrian mentioned, uh, we're working on um, some ASV CO2, high quality CO2 data sets from sail drones. And I'm also interested in using um, in situ data to uh, evaluate our system models. I'll talk more about um, my work later. Thanks. Okay, let's try Rick again. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, uh, let's hope that the internet keeps going. I'm Rick Wanikoff. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at uh, uh, the NOAA lab in Miami. Uh, I um, am an observationist and actually spending a lot of my time currently uh, working on uh, sustaining uh, global uh, ocean carbon uh, uh, observing networks. Uh, my uh, example uh, is an uh, uh, effort that we've uh, undertaken uh, for the last two decades in collaboration with Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines where we've installed um, systems on uh, cruise ships. Uh, and this is a uh, paper which came out late last year, uh, you know, providing a synthesis. And I won't go through all uh, the details, but I think the important point uh, which we have to appreciate, uh, in, particularly in a GAPS meeting, is how in how big the gaps are. And uh, this in this particular uh, example, which I believe is the best, uh, you know, uh, sample the real estate on the earth uh, there were about uh, over a million uh, pco2 data points uh, in the last 20 years uh, if we basically grid it in a sort of a conventional one by one by month uh, grid and there's a good reason to do that only 10 percent of the monthly grids are filled and this is in the best case so i think anytime we're talking about a observational based or data driven data based uh, system we have to recognize that uh, we have to do a significant amount of gap filling in order to get our results and keep that in mind thank you <laughs> 